On this very special Halloween edition of the Burnzo Cast, we have Revisiting the Blair Witch Project. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to a very special Halloween edition of the Burnzo Cast. This is your host, Matt Boo Earns speaking. Did you see what I did there? I said Boo Earns as though I'm a g- 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 ghost. Tonight we're going to be talking about what is probably my favorite horror film of all time, or at least a horror film that is definitely on my list of top five horror films of all time. Now, you may be thinking that this is a movie like A Nightmare on Elm Street, Halloween, Friday the 13th, or perhaps Night of the Living Dead, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, The Exorcist, movies like that. No, 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 my fellow ghouls. You may not agree that this film is the best horror film of all time, but I think we'll at least agree that it is one of the most unique movies, and it essentially spawned a whole new genre of horror films, which are referred to as found footage films. The movie I'm talking about, if you haven't guessed already, is 1999's The Blair Witch Project. <laughs> But before we dive into this special Halloween Burnzo cast episode, we do need to hear a quick word from our sponsors. So why don't we take a super quick break and we'll be right back after this quick message. <laughs> Ah, yes. And with the insertion of this electrode into the subject's frontal lobe, our creation should be finally complete. Years of work have led to this moment. Eh, Fritz? Yes, Master. Years upon years of work. Here we go, then. The moment of truth. Fire up the electrode! Look, Fritz. It's alive. It's alive! It's alive! Oh, actually, no, it's still dead. Well, that's it. I give up. Not worth the second try. What do you suggest we do now, Fritz? Master, perhaps your time could be better spent reading a book by Matt Burns. Did you know his books are on Amazon.com now? Many of them cost only 99 cents. At most, you're only going to pay about three dollars. Yes, that's it. A book by Matt Burns. Come, Fritz. We'll go purchase these books and then read together by the hearth. Yes, master. You are listening to Burnzo Cast Radio. Okay, welcome back to the Burnzo Cast. Again, this is episode number 11. It's a special Halloween episode entitled Revisiting the Blair Witch Project. And I just want to say, I just want to say, I'm sorry for doing this episode of the Burnzo Cast. Why am I sorry? I'm not really sure. There's no particular reason. I'm just, I'm just sorry. So let me take you back to the year 1999. There was a lot of major buzz in the air. Word was spreading about this movie with a witch in it, but it was called a project. So it sounded like a student film of some sort. It was not easy to see this film. Uh, It was mostly being shown in art house theaters across the United States. You'd have to be in New York or Los Angeles or Chicago or Austin or some other major city in order to see this film. Eventually, word was out that the Kendall Landmark Theater in Boston, or technically in Cambridge, was showing this film. 
I was about 17 years old at this time, and it wasn't exactly easy for me to get to the Kendall Theater since getting there involved some semi-complicated rides on the Red Line subway, and then about 20 minutes or so walking on top of that through Cambridge. I was only 17 years old at the time, and I didn't exactly know how to do all that. Buzz about the Blair Witch Project, however, was growing even stronger. And I mean, there hadn't been buzz like this, especially for an independent film, since Run, Lola, Run, which only came out a year earlier in 1998. The buzz surrounding Blair Witch, however, was even stronger than Run, Lola, Run. From what I was hearing, this was a must-see movie. Blair Witch Project apparently became such a success in the art house theaters that it eventually got a wide release. And in late summer 1999, it showed up at the nearest multiplex to where I lived, which at the time was the Showcase Cinema in Randolph, Massachusetts. Well, all right, let me actually correct that. Randolph was the nearest multiplex at the time that actually had stadium seating, which was a new addition to movie theaters in the late 1990s. Stadium seating was a key upgrade in it made a hell of a difference. Gone were the fears of sitting behind a lady with, like, big poofed out hair, or say a cowboy with a 10-gallon hat, which was always a major concern of mine. Wherever you sat in the theater, you would have an excellent unobstructed view of the movie screen. This was pretty much guaranteed. One day in the middle of the week, me and a couple of friends went to an early matinee showing of The Blair Witch Project, and I'm talking the earliest show here. It may have even been like the 11 a.m. showing. Why did we go so early? I have actually no idea, but it ended up being the perfect time, and it pretty much helped contribute to the perfect movie viewing experience. It's possible that the theater was completely empty other than us, but I will play it safe here and say there were maybe a few other people in the theater at the time. Either way, the emptiness of the theater added to the spookiness of the viewing experience. It almost felt as though you were lost and alone in the woods, kind of like the characters in the film. I actually don't think I would have been as creeped out if I had seen the movie at night with a packed theater, because if all those people were in the theater with me, I think I would have felt a little more safe or something like that. Being mostly alone in the theater definitely added to the creepiness and made you feel like you were lost in the woods. Now, the movie began with this film student named Heather documenting on Hi8 Video the making of her student film, which itself is a documentary about the Blair Witch who's been said to haunt the woods of Burkittsville, Maryland, formerly known as Blair. She recruits two film students named Josh and Mike to help her make the documentary. Josh will be doing the principal photography on the film. Mike will be the sound guy. Together, they travel to Burkittsville and interview some of the locals there about the Blair Witch. Many of the locals don't believe in the witch, but others tell stories of witch sightings, and they also tell a story of an old hermit named Rustin Parr, who in the 1940s was supposedly possessed by the witch and killed a bunch of children in town. When they're done interviewing the locals, Heather and the filmmakers then hike into the Blair Woods and try to find notable Blair Witch haunting locations, including a place called Coffin Rock. After a day or two of filming in the woods, the student filmmakers try to find their way back to civilization, but they end up going in circles and eventually realize they're lost. Every night when they camp, they hear strange noises outside their tent. They also find strange piles of rocks on the ground and stick figures hanging from the trees. Is somebody messing with them, or are they being haunted by the Blair Witch? All three of the student filmmakers eventually go a little crazy, especially Mike, who purposely kicks their map into the river because he feels it's been useless to them. Then one night, Josh disappears altogether, never to be seen again, and for the next few nights after, Heather and Mike hear Josh's screams in the distant part of the woods. Now, I won't tell you the rest of the plot, lest I spoil the film for you first-time viewers out there, but let's just say the rest of the movie is a terrifying cinematic experience. What I remember more than anything else about seeing The Blair Witch Project that one morning in late August 1999 was definitely the theater surround sound. Yes, the surround sound. Again, the Randolph Stadium Seating Cinema was a relatively new theater, so it had the latest 7.1 digital theater surround sound, or whatever the most top-of-the-line digital sound there was at the time. It was probably that THX surround sound. 
Do you remember how they used to have that THX logo at the beginning of all the movies and there would be that sampling of intense surround sound to give your ears a taste of how good that sound system was? Yes, it was that era, folks. It was an exciting time. Now, you would think for an independent film like The Blair Witch Project, a theater's sound system would be neither relevant nor really make much of a difference. You would think surround sound would be more important for a big budget blockbuster movie like Star Wars The Phantom Menace, which also was released in 1999. Or maybe the action-packed soundtrack heavy cyberpunk hit The Matrix, that was also released in 1999. As for The Blair Witch Project, well... You would think a simple stereo sound would suffice, or maybe even a 1980s era mono sound. You wouldn't think you would need that surround sound. This is not the case, though. Much to my surprise, surround sound turned out to be pretty much essential to optimizing the Blair Witch viewing experience. There are about seven scenes where the characters of Heather, Josh, and Mike are sleeping in their tent, and they're woken up by the aforementioned strange sounds in the woods. Initially, these noises are what sound like a handful of rocks being thrown against trees, something like that. Then as we progress further into the film, there are sounds of what sound like children giggling or babies crying even. And further into the film, when Josh has mysteriously disappeared, there's the sounds of Josh screaming. When you're in a theater that's practically empty and you hear these noises on a surround sound speaker system, it literally sounds like you're in a tent in the middle of the night, lost in the middle of the woods, and these noises are happening all around you. Long story short, the surround sound made you feel pretty much exactly how the characters felt in the movie. When the film finished and the house lights in the theater came up, I was sitting in my chair watching the credits that were underscored by rather creepy yet subtle atmospheric music, which is actually the only musical score in the entire film, by the way. And I simply remember being stunned. I know I may sound like I'm being dramatic here, but I don't remember a movie ever leaving the kind of impression on me that The Blair Witch Project did. I remember sitting in my seat feeling almost paralyzed because I was completely blown away by what I had just seen. I was creeped out, yes, that is true, but I think more than anything else, I was blown away because I knew I had seen something incredibly unique and amazingly brilliant. I remember saying to myself, okay, I gotta get up now and leave this theater, but I was dazed. I did eventually get up and leave the showcase cinema, but I couldn't shake that shocked feeling all day. Also, I should probably mention that I literally thought what I had just seen on the movie screen was absolutely real. Yes, I thought three student filmmakers went to Burkittsville, Maryland, again, formerly Blair, Maryland, and shot a documentary about the Blair Witch. They got lost in the woods while they were shooting the film, and then a year later, their footage was found. Even when all my friends insisted that it wasn't real, and even when I heard the actress who played Heather appeared on David Letterman or some other talk show to promote the film, I still thought it was all real. It was kind of like some form of cognitive dissonance. I was in denial that it didn't actually happen. Why? Because the movie was that convincing. Okay, so I know a lot of you think I'm exaggerating here. You maybe have seen The Blair Witch Project and you're saying, that movie's not scary. Or, that movie was all a bunch of hype. There was indeed a lot of hype surrounding the Blair Witch Project in 1999. There's no doubt about that. And judging whether a movie is good or bad is usually rather subjective. However, I was absolutely convinced that the Blair Witch Project was, all subjectivity aside, an objectively brilliant film. In order to test this hypothesis, that the Blair Witch Project was an objectively brilliant movie, I needed to make sure that the film withstood the test of time and also withstood the test of multiple viewings. I want to say that I went back to see The Blair Witch Project for a second time in the movie theater, but I can't say this with absolute certainty because I don't remember doing that. What I do know is that when the movie came out on video, however many months later, I was sure to purchase a VHS copy as soon as it was available. After a second viewing and even a third viewing of the movie, I knew my hypothesis was proven correct. The Blair Witch Project was indeed not only a brilliant horror film, but it was a brilliant film in general. 
For the next several years, I would watch The Blair Witch Project almost every October to get myself into the Halloween spirit. I did this maybe up until 10 years ago, and this was around the time when I stopped watching VHS movies altogether, mainly because the VHS medium was obsolete by this point. Not too long ago, however, I started getting back into VHS again. I unearthed many of my old VHS tapes, and The Blair Witch Project was one of the VHSs I unearthed the tape of which was still in rather excellent condition. Again, it had been about 10 years since I had last seen this movie, and I wanted to test to see whether the film held up after about 25 years. In fact, I think it's the 25th anniversary of the movie's release this year, 2024. I also wanted to see whether the film was as brilliant as I remembered it to be. I was about 10 years older from when I had last seen the film, and all the wiser. Surely this viewing would be the ultimate test to see whether The Blair Witch Project was one of the best horror films of all time. So I popped The Blair Witch VHS into my VCR, and I gave it a watch. Folks, I was not disappointed. Again, I know this sort of thing is subjective, but I think I would have to say that The Blair Witch Project is perhaps the best horror film of all time. I know a lot of horror movie buffs out there will beg to differ with me. I realize that some people may prefer slasher films like Halloween, Friday the 13th, Nightmare on Elm Street. Other horror nerds would slap me in the face and insist that a film like Night of the Living Dead or Texas Chainsaw Massacre are much better horror films than The Blair Witch Project. Then there would be the real horror movie connoisseurs who would probably point to some obscure foreign horror film that was made in Italy like Dario Argento's Suspiria or in Japan, Takashi she Mike's audition comes to mind, yada, yada, yada. And then, you know, who could forget about such horror classics as The Exorcist, Frankenstein, Dracula, Nosferatu, and even Slumber Party Massacre 3. Of course, that's a horror classic one, right? Look, I'm certainly not arguing that all these horror films aren't great horror films, but the thing is that most of those movies, with a couple of exceptions, are missing two main ingredients that The Blair Witch Project has. One of these ingredients is that what happens in The Blair Witch Project is quite possibly something that could happen in real life. I know a lot of people are raising their eyebrows now, but hear me out on this. First of all, it's very easy to get lost in the woods, right? We can all agree on that. However, it would also be possible for there to be some sort of anomalous electromagnetic Bermuda Triangle-like phenomenon found in the woods that could, I don't know, make us confused and disorientated, screwed with our compasses, made us hallucinate, and ultimately drove us to insanity. On top of all that, I don't know about you, but I think there is the possibility that an area deep in the woods could be cursed, whether it be due to ancient Indian burial ground or Indian battleground, something like that. Additionally, I think an area in the woods could be cursed due to occult practices. In Blair Witch, weird occult-like things happen at the place called Coffin Rock. And these dark occult rituals could have indeed opened a door that allowed very dark demonic energy into the woods. Okay, maybe you don't believe in demonic energy or opening doors to lower dimensions or even Bermuda Triangle-esque electromagnetic phenomena. But... The fact of the matter is that the Blair Witch story could possibly happen. I mean, it's not like this is child's play, right, where a possessed Chucky doll is going around murdering people. The Blair Witch Project never actually shows the witch. We just sense her presence. So it's kind of true to what most people would experience in a real haunting, whether this haunting is actually happening or being hallucinated for whatever reason. Actually, now that I think of it, you could toss aside the whole haunting element to Blair Witch Project and pretty much interpret the film as a completely non-paranormal story. Think about it now. Heather, Josh, and Mikey get lost in the woods. That's realistic enough so far. Then Heather, Josh, and Mikey start hearing strange noises in the forest when they're asleep at night. These noises could be attributed to hallucinations induced by the aforementioned Bermuda Triangle, like geomagnetic phenomenon, the electromagnetic frequencies of which could affect the brain and basically make a person feel as though they're being haunted. But then there's the ending. The witch finally kills Heather and Mikey, right? Ah, but what if that's not what happened? 
What if what happened is Josh, who had gone off missing by this point in the film, kind of went psycho from being lost in the woods and he was sleep deprived and hungry, etc. Not to mention the fact that he was pissed at both Heather and Mike for losing the map, right? So maybe Josh went and murdered Heather and Mikey because he was pissed off and maybe kind of crazy. That's an interesting interpretation, but it may not make all too much sense because at the end we see Mikey standing in the corner facing the wall, which we know is what the Blair Witch possessed Rustin Parr used to make children do when he slaughtered them back in the 1940s. And also, how do you explain the weird witchcrafts made out of the sticks and stones that the three film students encountered during their travels in the woods? There probably has to be some sort of paranormal element to that, but I suppose you could also chalk it up to a real-life coven or some other ritualistic occult-like behavior being done by the locals. Okay, moving on now. The second ingredient that the Blair Witch has that other horror films don't have is that it's really realistic. And I mean the acting and also the way it was shot. From what I understand, there was only about a 35-page screenplay written for the film, mainly as an outline, and the rest of the film, including all the dialogue, was apparently improvised. In fact, for much of the filming, there was no director or film crew even present. Heather, Mike, and Josh were literally lost in the woods by themselves, doing all the filming themselves, too. According to one YouTube video I happened to stumble upon, some of the Burkittsville townies, especially that mother and the baby that are interviewed at the beginning of the film, they weren't even acting or aware that they were in a real horror film. They simply thought they were helping out a few student filmmakers doing a small project. Having made some short films in my day and also being a former film student, I was surprised to hear that there was all this improvisation being done because this approach to filmmaking usually results in a messy disaster. Filming in this experimental, non-scripted way was indeed risky, but for the Blair Witch Project, it paid off big time because the acting in the film ended up being shockingly realistic. Take one scene, for example, while Josh is in the car and he's explaining to Heather that he has to check his depth of field chart to make sure he's operating the 16mm film camera properly. He explains to Heather that the lens he uses on the camera is confusing because the focal measurements are listed as meters, not feet. Heather insists that there are foot measurements on the lens in addition to the metric measurements, but Josh hazily says no, there aren't any, but actually there are, but he's not supposed to use those. By the end of the scene, we don't even know what he's really saying, nor do we know the point of the entire scene. We're left kind of feeling unclear about what they're even talking about and what Josh is even talking about. In other words, the exchange between Heather and Josh is so non-contrived and therefore realistic that you literally feel like it was a real conversation caught on a video camera. In fact, it actually sounds like a real conversation between two student filmmakers who don't really know what they're doing. There are several other examples of this throughout the film. One other notable scene that comes to mind is when Mikey is sitting in the woods taking a break from hiking and he's expressing some frustration. He snorts and he stumbles with his words and is about to say something, but that doesn't say it. But then Heather insists he says what's on his mind and he says he doesn't like having the video camera in his face all the time. If you watch this scene, it simply doesn't feel like you're watching a movie. The dialogue, if you even want to call it dialogue, is so method that it doesn't even feel like written dialogue. And I guess that makes sense because, again, the entire film's dialogue was supposedly improvised. In fact, the acting is so realistic and incredible in this film that it's surprising the actors didn't win any Oscars. Heather Donahue, now known as Rye Hance, the actress who played Heather in the movie, actually quote-unquote won a Razzie for Worst Actress due to her Blair Witch performance, which is a travesty because her acting in the film is insanely brilliant. At the time of its release, there was this big bandwagon of people who said she was annoying and everyone made fun of her big crying scene, the parody in Scary Movie comes to mind, where the tears are streaming out of her eyes and, you know, the snots are pouring out of her nose. I'm scared to close my eyes. I'm scared to open them. But please, please, please watch that scene today and tell me it didn't deserve an Oscar. And boy, what about that very end scene where she's screaming in hysterics? (coughs) 
I mean, that's not a horror movie scream. That's some hyper-realistic, terrorizing, hysterical shrieking you would literally hear from a person who feels they're about to die. Speaking of that end scene, I need to talk about how that sequence in the abandoned house was shot and how absolutely freaking brilliant it was. I'm talking about how the audio is separated from the video throughout much of the climactic finale. What I mean is that we're often watching the film from Heather's point of view, shot on a silent 16mm camera, while the audio we hear is always from Mike's Hi8 video camera. This is super disorientating because we're in Heather's point of view at many times, so we would expect her screams to be close, but they're instead heard in the distance. This needed to be done because audio has to be recorded on a separate device like a Nagra or a DAT when you're shooting on film, unlike a video camera where video and audio are recorded onto the same tape simultaneously. I'm not sure if the filmmakers knew the end result of cutting back and forth between cameras while using a single audio source would be disorientating for the viewer, or maybe it was a happy accident. Along with the film's sound design, the use of the handheld Hi8 video camera also helps create a feeling of disorientation for the viewer. Watching the film today, I don't find the handheld shaky camera work as jarring as I remember finding it when I first saw the film in the theater. I don't know if I'm more used to handheld videos these days since there's so many on social media and YouTube, etc. Or perhaps the shakiness of the camera was more noticeable on a giant movie screen when I first saw the movie. When you research the film online, you'll inevitably stumble upon stories about people who vomited or had seizures from the motion sickness of the film's camera work. Those stories, of course, could have just been lore created to help market the film, but I can also see why people prone to motion sickness may feel as though they need to pop some Dramamine while they're watching the film. Aside from its disorientating effects, the handheld amateur-styled video also helps add to the movie's realism, especially the parts where the video would start recording just a beat after the actor would begin speaking. What I mean is that the very beginning of the dialogue would be cut off with a pop because the camera hadn't begun recording yet. It may have been edited this way on purpose, but it's also possible that this was unintentional since all the filming was being done by the actors themselves and so much of the dialogue was improvised. Either way, the end result is a greater feeling of realism. Long story short, realism is key when you're trying to make a truly horrifying film, and The Blair Witch Project is probably one of the most realistic feeling horror films ever shot, and therefore one of the most horrifying. Upon doing further research, I discovered that there was actually a plan to reveal the witch at one point during the movie. I think it's when Heather is running from the tent, and she hysterically screams, (laughs) Supposedly, there was an actor or actress dressed as the Blair Witch, and Josh was supposed to pan his camera over to the left at this point. But he forgot to pan over, and the witch never got revealed. This was definitely a happy accident, because if the witch ever did get revealed, it would have ruined the entire film. Of course, most non-indie horror films, especially those filmed these days, would have been pressured, likely by studio executives, to have a jump scare reveal of the witch. along with other spooky computer-generated elements. Although these kind of jump scares and special effects can be horrifying in their own way, it's the very fact that they are effects that immediately render the horror movie less realistic, and thus much less horrifying than a movie like The Blair Witch Project turned out to be. So what do you think? Am I crazy to call The Blair Witch Project the best horror film of all time, and perhaps one of the best films of all time? I mean, you have to take into consideration that this film was made in a way that was completely unprecedented and audaciously experimental. The filmmakers basically gave Heather, Josh, and Mike a couple of cameras and some audio equipment and then had them go camp in the woods for eight days. Each day, the actors would get some notes telling them what to do or how to act for the day. But other than those notes, everything was completely improvised. The film crew was never even present on set. They mostly hung out dressed in full camouflage, mind you, in the outskirts of the woods, occasionally setting up props like the piles of rocks on the ground or the creepy stick figures hanging from trees for the actors to stumble into and or react to in an organic, non-scripted manner. 
The actors did all the filming themselves and for the most part never broke character unless of an emergency, in which case they would say the safe word taco and everyone would get real for a few moments. If there was an even bigger emergency, the actors would use walkie-talkies and say the word bulldozer, in which case the film crew would go and help them. To paraphrase the 1997 backstage casting call for Blair Witch Project, the safety of the actors was the film crew's priority. The comfort of the actors, however, was not. Each day during the shoot, the film crew provided less and less food for the actors to eat, forbade them to ever shower, and overall tried to get them as stressed and uncomfortable as they possibly could without putting them in any actual danger. The end result of all this was perhaps the most authentic performances ever to be put onto film. Normally, an experiment so ambitious would have turned into a disaster, since the success of film shoots usually depend on a well-scripted and well-coordinated production schedule. But the makers of the Blair Witch Project decided to roll the dice, and it paid off both in the sense that the film was such an artistic success, but also in the sense that it was such a financial success as well. The Blair Witch Project, after all, was shot for about $30,000, but it ultimately made a whopping $250 million at the box office worldwide. So when you take all the above into consideration, I think you have no choice but to conclude that The Blair Witch Project is indeed the best horror film of all time even though it may not be a favorite horror film of yours. As far as it being the best film of all time, it is most definitely a contender for that as well. Also, I must say Heather Donahue's performance in The Blair Witch Project is one of the best female performances in cinematic history. Like I said before, her performance definitely deserved an Oscar, and there ought to be an official public apology for ever having given her a Razzie. You know, just the fact that Heather Donahue was given a Razzie for her performance in Blair Witch Project pretty much proves that we're still incredibly dumb as a society. And we're especially dumb when it comes to being exposed to new forms of art. It always takes us a good 20 years or so to appreciate new art in a way that it fully deserves. The independent filmmaker John Cassavetes used to make a joke where he would pretend he was a viewer watching one of his films in the theater and he would scream, A new experience! Oh no! Anything but that! Don't get me wrong here. It's abundantly clear that the Blair Witch Project was embraced by many people when it was released, as the box office earnings prove. But I'm not sure if the full cinematic experience that was the Blair Witch Project was ever fully appreciated until years later. Blair Witch Project certainly provided a cinematic experience unlike any other up until that point, and very few movies will ever come close to matching such a cinematic experience in the future. Even though many found footage films have tried to match and or outright imitate the Blair Witch experience, they never even came close. Blair Witch Project will always be a rare, one-of-a-kind film. Alright, you cute little ghouls and goblins, this concludes episode number 11 of the Burnzo Cast. I have a feeling that a lot of you listeners out there have seen the Blair Witch Project, and you likely agree with most, if not all, of what I said about the film in this podcast episode. Some of you, however, may completely despise the Blair Witch Project, and that's okay too, even though I would encourage you to maybe take another look at it, especially if you haven't seen the film in a while. Now that the dust of all the hype has settled after about 25 years since its release, I think it'll be easier for you to watch the film with a fresh objective eye and possibly, just possibly, see it for the work of genius that it is. All right, everyone, more episodes to come. I think my next podcast episode will be a Christmas-related episode. I'm not totally sure yet, but... There's definitely going to be a 12th episode before the end of this year, 2024. So until then, can you guys just please do me a flavor? Just knock it off and do me this one flavor and be well. Hey everyone, if you want to check out my writing, be sure to check out my blog, thebernsodiaries.com. And also check out my books at Amazon.com. I have many novels there, including Johnny Cruz, Supermarket Zombies, Weird Monster, 
The Woman and the Dragon, and I also have many Kindle singles there and other books, including memoirs. So be sure to check out my blog, thebernzodiaries.com, and also my books at amazon.com.